And so, what did Bibo tell you? Uh, Zenaida Amador. At that time, I fancied myself a singer. Mm-hmm. So, I was singing my way through the roles. And one day she goes to me, Don't sing like that. You're not Barbara Streisand. And I go, huh, I'm not? <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> and of course, everybody laughed and she got totally pissed. Williams is an actor, director, drama coach, and mid-level mahjong player. Currently, he is the artistic director of Full House Theatre Company at Resorts World Manila. So, Michael, when did you realize you were an actor? I didn't until I was told ah. by my mentor, Bibot, Zinaida Amador. Okay. Um, How did you la- land in repertory in the first place? I'd always been performing in school. I was part of the Glee Club. I was part of the, you know, the Junior Drama Guild. And um, I was on my way to the States when a friend of mine said, I was about to migrate. And I had like, like two months or three months waiting before I actually left. And he said, you know, there's enough time to do a play. Why don't you audition for Repertory Philippines? He was currently doing Annie. Oh, so you were supposed to leave the Philippines? Yes. But theater kind of anchored you here. Yeah. So he was in that show and he said they're opening auditions for the next uh, productions coming up. And why don't you um, audition? Because in those days, we didn't have karaoke. Mm-hmm. We would go to his house and we'd Sing all... around the piano? Absolutely. So he said, hey, you know, you've got a voice. Why don't you audition? So I did. And uh, I auditioned three times because they kept turning me down. And then the third time, I said, hey, why are they turning me down? I have a voice. So I, I asked the pianist, could you please not play? <laughs> I'm going to sing a cappella. And I did. And they, they, then they took me. And uh, I was in um, a big musical at the Rizal Theater, uh, the defunct Rizal Theater. Which I miss, yes. And then after that, they put me into the season play at the Incident Life Theater, and then it was clear sailing from there on. And so, what did Bibo tell you? Uh, Zenaida Amador. At that time, I fancied myself a singer. Mm-hmm. So, I was singing my way through the roles. And one day she goes to me, Don't sing like that. You're not Barbara Streisand. And I go, huh, I'm not? <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> and of course, everybody laughed and she got really totally pissed. Um, and she decided to make an actor out of me. And she, she pointed out that I was able to interpret the songs in a kind of character. She says, you know, you're not just a singer, you're an actor. And she gave me roles and she, we worked together and she taught me. And um, I discovered that I, that I was an actor also. But although I have a bit of a difficulty uh, with that definition of myself. Mm-hmm. When you're filling out forms and you say occupation, I can't put actor. So what do you put? I put performer or theater artist, you know. I think it's very limiting to say that you're just an actor. That's true. Because uh, I'm not just that. Yes, you have to say theater artist. Yeah. Because people tend to put you in a box. Yeah. It's, it's the same with me. You know? And yeah, um, also, writer. necessity dictates that you do many things. You can't yes. just be an actor, especially uh, in the year that in the year when I began, 1984. 384, you had to be uh, industrious. You had to be able to do many things. So I was uh, part of the light crew at some point. I was part of the stage oh, management. Great. So you, at some it point. was all around training. Yeah. Uh, many, many people from the Insider Life uh, days of Repertory Philippines will tell you that they probably remember me most for being the doorman. Mm-hmm. I would be the one at the door saying, season ticket holder number one. Then they'd line up, I'd open the door for them. So, um, what happened to the migrating? That didn't happen. And then, um, did theater work until 1989 when we were chosen to be part of the uh, original cast of Miss Saigon in London. And so, um, before you got into theater, what did you see yourself becoming when you grew up? As in career-wise? Um, I was a bit confused 
I was an IT. I was a computer major. Oh wow! I I worked with uh, in in the uh, Cordon Bleu Ecole de Manille mm -hmm. in in Green Hills. I was there with working with Ludette Dayrit mm -hmm. as part of that group for a little while. Um, I thought maybe I'd be a chef. Uh, a so, chef slash IT person. Right. Who ends up in theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, can we offer you something to drink? Um, Malbec? <laughs> Water? <laughs> coffee, coffee? Coffee would be fine. Okay. Um, Gamba, please. Uh, our assistant Gamba will give you our coffee. Yes, he is our assistant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, how would you describe the state of Philippine theater today? Because mm -hmm. it seems to me that there's so much more going on than in past years. Yeah, it's very exciting to be um, a practitioner, also an audience of the of uh, Philippine theater now. The kind of uh, part players in the industry that that push the envelope, they're bigger productions, more mm -hmm. streamlined, more sophisticated. There's a lot more practitioners now that are trained, the triple threat, Mm -hmm. Used to be uh, a, a, a fluke of nature. Yeah. When um, it was my day, very few of them were, very few of us were, were trained in all three disciplines of singing, acting, and dancing. But now this generation of kids performing, a lot of them have training in all the disciplines, and then you can see them, um, you know, um, performing. Um, like that, the triple threats that they are, and it's amazing. Does this mean that the theater is now a viable career path, as in people can now make a living? You know, as theater artists? Um, that was my um, late mentor's vision. She said she um, created Repertory Philippines to prove that theater could be a viable career path for young artists and theater practitioners, and she created repertory and it was known as the most commercial theater company of its day. Mm -hmm. It didn't have any government support. Uh, it made its own, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it had a, a, a business side of it too that was very uh, uh, efficient. Today, it's, it's, it's become a, a, a proper industry. That's great. Yeah, although we're not quite there yet. We're not yet, we don't have, uh, as much support from the private sector or uh, any government institution, it's still quite, we're still quite on our own. The theater companies, um, a member or practitioners or actors don't have uh, benefits. We don't have SSS, we don't have those things yet. Uh, but we're already starting to galvanize. We have a little, we have pocket groups. We've got, um, Theater Actors Guild. Yeah, and there's so many theater companies. Now. We have Phil Stage, which is the umbrella group of all the professional. Yeah, there are, there are weekends when you really have to super schedule your time because right. there are plays on opposite sides of right. the city, and you have right. to somehow make them all. Yes, and it's so exciting because the uh, the material that's being presented is quite diverse. Yes. So there's uh, something for everybody. Yeah. And so actors have a reputation for being dramatic in real life, as in, you know, they're, they're very method, as in they claim they are possessed by a character. Is that just drama or is it true that actors get possessed by their... I wouldn't say possessed, but you know, you, you have to understand, you work yourself into a character, a mode of thinking, a way of reacting to things um, for months before you open the show. Mm -hmm. And then when you open the show, you are that person for the entire run of that show. So for a good two, three, four hours of the day, you are that person. And I, I figure that when you were doing Miss Saigon in London, you were for all inter for all intents and purposes your character. Right. As in you leave the theater, yeah. people expect you to be that person. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I I've I've been in a situation where I did a show here. And we were with such intensity that I didn't know I was actually behaving a little bit like mm. that character that um, I was portraying. It, it was an unintentional thing, but I think it, it, it comes, it's part of the course when you imbibe or, you know, try to be that person and um, it, it alters you a little bit. And, you know, sometimes it can kill you. Look at yeah. people like Heath Ledger. Yes, yeah. yes. When you, so, go, when you go really deep so and dark. So what do you do to shed uh, character that you've been playing? Uh, I guess I'm really lucky in that 
uh, that happens easily for me. I'm readily able to let go of those things. I have a lot of things that distract me. I like pets. Mm-hmm. I like cooking. I like going out. You, you like know. playing mahjong? I like playing mahjong. I mean, those forms of entertainment that um, don't require much engagement. Just really easy, relaxed. Uh, a lot of unwinding. Do you, would you say that being an actor um, and getting into the skins of fictional characters does this give you more access to your emotions? Because, you know, it, it's amazing, but a lot of people cannot express mm. their emotions. There's some bar to it. Personally speaking, for me, I, I, I am like that. I, I wear my heart on my sleeves. People generally know exactly how I feel about them. Um, my close friends can read me like a book. Mm -hmm. But I think, in general, Asians have more access to their emotions as opposed to our Western actors counterparts. I think they are more technical. They have to sit down and really analyze why, how, what could this person feel like versus that, you know, the situation. They, a lot of Asian artists, theater artists, are very instinctive. Um, so I don't necessarily think that actors per se are uh, have access. Uh, it is more a cultural thing. It's more of a thing. cultural thing, yeah. Yeah, because... Uh, now that you bring it up, it's true. I don't often hear of uh, Filipino actors saying, no, but what's my motivation? Yeah, they cetera, get it, right? Yeah, they, get, they get it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and if, you, if you look at um, um, acting on TV, yeah. there's not a lot of discussion. They give you the script, boom, you're good to go. They get it. They know. You know it's, uh, it seems to be the, the common thing among mm -hmm. Asian actors. So yeah. what's the craziest thing you've witnessed in the theater? Yeah, for instance, your mentor was um, Zenaida Amador, and we all hear stories of her yelling at people. Yes, and... yes. So I guess it comes to a point where being yelled at is De rigueur, normal. Yeah. It also comes with, I mean, you have to take it every, all of it in context. I mean, she was building an industry. She yeah, had so they to, were the first, yeah. yeah. She had to fight every inch of the way. So she used to have her office in, a, uh, in her Volkswagen. Oh. <laughs> and she had to sell her shows on purely the strength of her conviction that it's a good show where so there was none. Round up everyone you know yeah. and, and drag them over. Yeah. And there is a, a story that the first show ever of Repertory Philippines had only seven people in the audience. Okay. And there were 14 people in the cast. <laughs> and of the seven people, um, they were all relatives. Okay. So it was like that. Mm -hmm. So she valued the work so much that she hated anybody who was a, you know, a dilettante or just a, you know, dabbling. Mm -hmm. She wanted ev everybody to be a professional participant with that amount of commitment. So we've had people who are bankers and, uh, you know, had other day jobs who would come to work, our rehearsals would be at five mm -hmm. after office hours, but they were there. They were committed, they were pros. She created all these professional actors that had other lives, because it was the only way that it could be done then. So she was constantly fighting for, to achieve her ideal. And I remember we, we would be sat down at a company call and she would inspire us with, with things like, uh, she would say to you, for example, are, what do you, when you, you could think of, of your theater work in two ways. You could think of yourself as uh, a bricklayer and you're just building a wall, mm -hmm. brick by brick. Or you could think of yourself as somebody who is building a cathedral. Mm -hmm. So which are you? You know, are you a bricklayer or are you building a cathedral? So you have a larger picture, picture of yourself in the scheme of this industry, right? And you're thinking, yeah, you know, I'm one of the few that is at the forefront of this particular theater company and I don't want to just be a you know a bricklayer building a wall I want to be more so that inspired us to seek more information be more proactive in, mm -hmm. in the industry and so over the years we have worked with a lot of theater companies and productions what would you say is your best performance of all time <laughs> and also what was the most difficult role you ever had to do and how did you okay just to give you an idea in 1983 uh, repertory had two seasons a year every season had five plays 
Okay. So that's 10 plays a year, plus the large musical outside. So mm -hmm. effectively, we were doing a play a month. We would rehearse in the afternoon. For the next play. Next play, and perform the evening. From there until 89, 1989, I'd already done over 100 productions. And in some productions, I would be doing two roles. So there's a whole slew of plays and musicals, productions that I've done. And there's a lot of them that I love for different reasons. Mm -hmm. There is a play called, um, what was it called? Um, Moose Murders. Moose Murders. It's this awful, awful, loopy um, script. But is it a I, detective kind of, mystery? Yeah. Kind of. So uh, it's this really super dysfunctional family. I, think I really s still think that it's ahead of its time, that script. Um, and I played a character named Stinky, mm -hmm. who was a 1960s throwback. You know, flower child, yeah. totally hippie. Yeah, totally zonked out on weed. Mm -hmm. Who had an Oedipus complex, always trying to put his arm around his mom. You know, okay, it's totally whacked out. Mm -hmm. But I had so much fun with that that role that um, for years people kept reminding me of it. I saw you as stinky. Hey, stinky. <laughs> you know, so that was fun. That was fun. Um, and for that, I liked it. One of my all-time favorites is. Uh, a Man of La Mancha, mm -hmm. where, where I played Don Quixote. Mm -hmm. I love that musical because of, of, of what it's about. Yeah, you know? and of course in the Philippines it has a very strong political uh, Absolutely. content. Absolutely, yes. and uh, I love that for that. And the music of it was uh, beautiful, the characters are gorgeous. I loved Les Mis oh. when I did Les Mis as Javert um, because of the stories. <laughs> um, in the back, uh, uh, there's a death scene. Mm -hmm where Javert jumps off the bridge. Yes. So I'm there singing full-throated, you know, all, all, you know, pulled out all the stops, singing every night, jumping off the bridge, and then collapsing into the pool of swirling smoke to roll yes. off stage. At the end of that song, I'm parched. Okay. So I'm always going, okay, I'm gonna go to the back and get a drink of water. So all hushed, right? Every night I'm like that. This particular night, I go to the to the hallway in Miracle Theater, and I see the dressing room of Leon Roque, who has on his table a a tin of pastilles, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The kind that you know is hard to open because it sure gets between the cap and the thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying, I'm stealing a couple of these pastilles, and this thing just pops open. The whole content explodes, of the thing explodes yes. up, and of course I yell out an expletive. Right? <laughs> okay. And. Unbeknownst to me, the microphone is left on. Oh. So it was heard in the house. Mm -hmm. You hear, uh, who was it, Leo Valdez going, God on high. Hi. Then somebody gets <laughs> expletive. And, and then, of course, Robbie Guevara comes to me and says, did you, did you yell something obscene? No, well, yeah. You were heard in the house. No, you know, pulling my leg. Here comes B-Bot. Dun, 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 dun. I'm totally freaking out, right? And she goes, if you have to curse, do it in French. <laughs> so I'm like, Whoosh. right? And because the, the sound tech never had to turn off my mic. Mm, right. Right. So that one night she forgot. And that, and I, I just, that's just one of the funniest things that I remember. This heavy training you had, you said, you know, uh, 10 plays a year, etc., etc. That must have been really good training for for London. Yes. Was, was there any culture shock going from yes. Philippine theater to and I remember um, you know, my my um, my good friend Junix mm -hmm. in Ocean. Yeah. May you know he's rest in peace. When we got to last scene in a Robbie Williams video. <laughs> <laughs> when we got to um, to London and we were starting rehearsals, we were going um. Is this it? What do you mean? Um, isn't this is all we're doing? Right? We wake up in the morning, we do aerobics class, we break for lunch, we do, we watch, um, uh, we immerse ourselves in Vietnam, Vietnamese culture, we watch movies, you know, and then we do two scenes and then we go home. That's it. Because back home, a day would be like this. On a weekend, I would wake up at 10 in the morning, be prepared to sing by 11, mm -hmm. go to, um, one of the cafes in Salcedo or Legazpi village where they are having lunch. Mm -hmm. We perform for those people. And then by two o'clock, we should be done. 
rush to Land Bank where we have our rehearsal hall, grab the, the production manager, go collecting props for about an hour, beg, borrow, go back to Land Bank and rehearse at 4 to 6.30, run from Land Bank to Insular Life. We hot foot it because it's faster okay. than taking a car. Be in the theater by seven. So put Buendia on. To Paseo. Yeah, okay. Be in the theater at seven o'clock. Put on makeup. Be ready to perform at eight thirty. At seven thirty, house opens at seven forty. Perform at eight. Finish at midnight. Do that whole thing again. Yeah. So life seems so much harder, right? So when we got to London, it was so easy for us. It's like hearing your ears pop. This is like, is we're just on. doing one show, Yeah, that's it. We have no product lunches to rehe rehearse in the middle of the matinee or in the evening. We would do like product lunch rehearsals between shows. Yeah. After we have our meal, we would rehearse. So we were, we were like... It was like a vacation for you. Yes, yes, but, but it was also, it wasn't as hard as you might think. We were thinking, you know, we wanted to be actors, we're living the life. This is an actor's life. We're doing nothing but rehearsing. We're performing. This is it, man. We're just, so we were on the, you know, we just, we were just uh, happy to be doing what we did. And then when we got to London, we realized, oh, you know, <laughs> we were doing so much yeah. back in Manila. So Filipinos have always had lively arguments about, well, everything basically, but especially politics. But because of social media and the atmosphere that we're living in today, the discussion has become especially toxic and vicious. And so, um, do you do you follow politics at all? Uh, are you on the social media? Yeah, I I follow um, uh, Philippine politics and American politics. It yes. fascinates me mm -hmm. um, how polarized it's gotten. And and how very much like theater. Yeah, it, it all is. Yes. Yeah, and how actually um, it is a form of theater. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, actually it is. Um, and and how um, PR, public pub, public relations, and um, news articles, may they be real or fake, mm -hmm. actually shapes the way people think. Yes, the whole you know social media, mm -hmm. you can actually choose what you see and what you don't see, and create a kind of an echo chamber where you hear nothing but those things that you want to hear and where everybody it, and it magnifies where your yes. original opinion which i think think helps polarize people does, does this cause you anxiety or? um it, it, yes it, it does uh, but i've decided that to be proactive about it i mean they um, have taken over social media yes and have used it you could say weaponized They've it weaponized yes um, and a lot of people I know have decided, you know, oh, it's too toxic. I don't want to, I'm going to go off of social media. Yes. And I think that's sad uh, because if you are capable, one of those people who are more discerning and can discern um, fake news from real news, you could actually be helping disseminate what is uh, the... What is true. Yeah, what is true and strengthening or creating a better kind of social media as opposed to pulling away from it and being apathetic. Instead of leaving it. Leaving it to them yes. and having that space yeah. to do with as they will. So by default, yeah. Yeah. I mean, why pull yourself out of that discussion when you could contribute something that is positive or or even, even just present uh, an opposing, uh, possibly different um, perspective? Mm -hmm. So... You manage to stay engaged, to stay in the social media, and you don't run them off. No, I don't. Or at least pull um, out your hair. I, I, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it gets aggravating when you think that some people are actually barefaced, you know, about um, their posts, and, or blinded, or are un, unwilling to compromise their, their opinions. Yes, or, because we know that um, correcting fake news with the facts never works. Never works. When, when people make their minds up, They just shut down, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, that's up to those people. As far as I'm concerned, I've done um, in my little sphere of influence, because I don't have a lot of followers, I'm just, you know, little old me, but I have not disengaged from a, uh, a potentially positive um, discourse or discussion mm -hmm. with some people who may change their mind. And, but that, that's a two-way street. I mean, 
I look at everything, so it, it doesn't preclude the possibility that I might change my mind about some things mm -hmm. as well. You know, it, it's like um, giving up if you, you become apathetic to the idea of your influence on social media, I think. Mm. And so, would you consider yourself an optimist? Mm, I try to be, but it's difficult. Mm. Uh, I try mm. to be. Uh, I think generally I am optimistic, uh, but sometimes you get tired and you're not emotionally equipped to, to be optimistic. And I have my moments when I'm dark and in the doldrums and... What stresses you out? As in, <laughs> what doesn't stress at, me out? What, whether at work or in real life, what stresses you out? I like to see a clear path through my work. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes there are challenges. Um, those are interesting. Uh, it's very interesting to try to figure them out. Uh, but they are also sometimes a cause of stress when you come to an impasse and you can't seem to get around uh, uh, an obstacle. Um, but that's not the kind of stress that is debilitating to me. I don't know. Um, discord with friends maybe is a, a source of. And, and how stress. does it? How does the stress manifest itself? Um, me personally, lack of sleep. Ah, that's uh, I ruminate. Long. Yeah, and some people get hives or. Yeah, I. I have uh, vitiligo, mm -hmm. S I, s small bits of it, and I think that every time I get stressed, uh, ah, you little they, rashes turn up. Mm -hmm. they, they they get active. And so, what do you do to get rid of the stress? You know, I like getting massages. I go to the uh, to the gym. Uh, I eat. I have a cocktail now and then. You know, mm -hmm. um, I visit with friends. Things that you know regular people do. Um, watch a movie. And then, in my observation. I seen anxiety is more rampant now because we're constantly swamped with information. Yeah. And much of the information is about politics right. worldwide. And it's a right. really it's a dreadful situation. And it's also so. the times we live in, no? Things mm -hmm. are things are a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. Um there's uh, traffic problems, there's all sorts of things that, that thwart you from doing what you wanna do. Actually even entertainment now is stressful. For instance, I watch Game of Thrones, so right. I realized after watching episode two, it's like, oh no, I'm stressed because yeah. I know that some some of them are going to die, and yeah. then later I think, but these are fictional characters. Yeah. But yeah, I have invested years <laughs> yeah. of my life in yes. the survival of these people, so it it used to, it, it makes me kind of miss escapism. Yeah. <laughs> And then we're cat people. How did you become a cat person? I'm actually a, an animal lover. Oh, okay. So not necessarily just cats. I happen you, to have cats. You've had dogs, you've had cats. I've had, growing up, we've had dogs, cats, uh, pigeons, geese, goldfish. We had a monkey. We had a parrot. My brother kept snakes. We, had, we had rabbits. We you had, had snakes in the house? A couple, but not in the house. They were in like their own, you know, aquariums and things. Won't they, won't they escape and, you know, eat all the... Uh, Chickens in I the never really, I never really paid attention to the snakes. We had rabbits and other, other, you know, furry, fuzzy things that I could oh, touch. It, it's very Doctor Doolittle. Yeah, yeah. We had, um, yeah, we had all sorts. I have an affinity for, I guess, you know, cats and dogs are easier mm -hmm. to. Right now, I have cats. Do you find that cats are a mental health um, solution? Not necessarily, because they could drive you up the wall. That's true. But they're easy. They're they take care of themselves. They're very affectionate, and if they want to show affection to you, you will know. Yes, because cats are not by nature affectionate. Yeah, and, and they won't take no for an answer. Mm. They need your attention. They'll be on your table, they'll be on your lap, they'll be on your pen. So last question. Any material on earth that you can produce um, on stage, what would you like to? I would like to do, there are two things that I've been thinking of doing. One is, um, I, I, well, I don't think I could personally could do it. It's not really my material. Not, um, I, I, I like the material, but it's not something that I would produce necessarily. Uh, it's Enemy of the People. Oh, you've said. Arthur Miller. Oh, Arthur Miller, yeah. Yes. Um, I think that's timely. It, it's, uh, it's about a lot of things that are uh, topical. Um, the other thing that I would like to do is um, Gross Indecency which is the, it's a play about the trial of Oscar Wilde. Ah, ha, ha, okay. I think it's very interesting how, now he's like their, you know, national artist. Have they but apologized to Oscar Wilde I for don't, what they did? I don't know. I, because they apologized to Alan Turing. Yeah. Yes, 
right? That's another interesting story. I mean, yeah. uh, this guy was, uh, he was put into jail. Yeah. And he was uh, badly abused, beaten up there, and he lost his hearing, and he escaped into his writing. Um, but it was so sad to think that somebody uh, with a mind like his, yes. you know, to be uh, to have gone through something like that. I, and it's how um, how you, you could see that whole situation degenerating in the trial. Yes. Um, that's I don't know if that'll ever see the light of production locally. If anybody would be interested in that. Most indecency. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. Yeah.